So hi, um, welcome to the perception and manipulation session. I'm Alexandre Siqueira um, from the Virtual Experiences Research Group, University of Florida. Um, I'm very excited to be here. We have five very interesting papers ahead of us. Um, it's about scaled hands, temperature, um, decision making and gambling. Um, uh, reminding you all that I'll be monitoring a slide for your questions and I'm pretty sure there will be several questions. This is very, uh, they're all very interesting papers. Um, with that said, um, uh, our first paper is detection of scaled hand interactions in virtual reality, the effects of motion direction and test complexity from um, Shai Ismaili. Hello everyone, my name is Shay Esmaeli and I'm going to attend to present our paper, Detection of Scaled Hand Interactions in Virtual Reality, the Effects of Motion Direction and Task Complexity. VR technologies have been around for decades in order to create simulated environments. Its applications have been used in different areas. For example, we have educational applications that can offer individual and collaborative learning experiences for teachers and students entertainment related applications like a variety of VR games that are really common and popular. We have training applications such as medical training, military training, and many, many more areas that virtual reality can be found in. By tracking the head, hands, and entire body, users can no. interact with virtual environments using familiar movements and body gestures, often as a goal is to make VR interactions more realistic and closer to the real world, as well as natural and intuitive for the users. Therefore, virtual movements are usually determined by a one-to-one -one mapping based on physical movements in the real world. This mapping will let users' interactions in virtual world being the same as real world. However, one-to-one -one mappings might not always be preferable or possible for all VR applications. For example, when we have a limited physical space, we are bound by this limitation and we are not able to explore fully in virtual world. Or when we want to interact with distant objects in the virtual world, but we are limited by the actual reach distance in the real world. To address this problem, modified interaction techniques are sometimes used. For example, redirected walking techniques allow users to uh, use their physical walking but traverse virtual spaces that are larger than the physical space. Another technique regarding the, hand, the head movement is amplified head rotation in which similar um, smaller physical turns are mapped to larger virtual turns which allow the users to view the entire surrounding environment, but with very small head movements. For hand movement, changing the scaling can also be used to reach far away objects, which has been introduced in the GoGo -Go technique. And these are just a few examples of interaction techniques. So focusing on the hand remapping techniques, uh, there are various methods such as GoGo -Go technique, body warping and word warping and so on. In this paper, we focus on hand movements with gain-based warping. Gain-based warping scales the position of the virtual hand by a constant value along the displacement vector between the physical hand and the world origin. Therefore, by using this technique, we can make hand movements in virtual world either faster or slower than the real hand movement speed. But how about the users? Do they still feel natural and normal when using these modified interaction techniques? or do they perceive the differences? And if yes, what are the effects on the user experience in virtual world? Since large deviations in interaction fidelity may potentially provide distractions or a loss of a perceived realism for users. In order to address these questions, previous work has been done on estimating the detection threshold using psychometric functions for uh, some of the hand remapping techniques. But there is a still little knowledge on detection thresholds for a scaled hand movements or the gain-based warping technique that we talked previously, especially regarding the different types of hand motion 
and in different uh, scenarios with different task complexities. So inspired by this motivation, we want to answer the following research questions. First, how do detection threshold estimations differ within each single degree of freedom for a scaled hand motion? And second, how do detection threshold estimation change with respect to task complexity? For example, complex reaching motions in cognitively demanding game scenarios with different levels of complexity. So in order to answer our research questions, we conducted two psychophysical experiments to be able to measure user perception and then to estimate the detection threshold using psychometric functions. In experiment one, we only focused on simple hand movements and limiting the user to move their hand in only one direction at a time to answer our first research question. And in experiment two, we focus on different levels of cognitively demanding scenarios in a game context in order to increase the, the cognitive demands for users. In this experiment, we didn't limit the user's hand movements and they could have moved their hand freely. In both of the experiments, we adopted the two alternative force choice method in which participants were exposed to different magnitudes of a scaled hand movements in virtual reality while moving their hand. And they were being asked to choose whether their hand movement was normal or not normal based on their perception of the virtual hand movement. So let's start with the first experiment, which is the simple hand movement. In this, in this experiment, we had two independent variables. The first independent variables, we had 29 scale values. Uh, for slow scale values, which were slower than normal, we had 14 different uh, values between 0 0.5 to 1. Then we had the normal one, which was the one-to-one -one mapping, and then faster than normal, which was uh, in the range of one to two. And the second independent variable is the three directions that we have, X, Y, and Z. X presents the horizontal plane, Y presents the vertical plane, and Z presents the depth plane. In this experiment, we followed a within subjects of study design with repeated measures, and we had 46 university students uh, as our participants. In this video, you can see the differences between the slow and fast scale hand movements compared to the normal hand movement. At the top, you can see the slowest hand movements in virtual world. The hand movement is much slower than the real world. In the middle, you can see the normal hand movement, which is the one-to-one -one mapping between physical hand and the virtual hand. And in the bottom, you can see the fastest hand movement, which in the real world, yeah, sorry, in the uh, virtual world, the hand movement is much faster than the normal. Here you can see a demo of experiment one setting. The user is moving the, his hand in um, X, now in the Z, and now in the Y direction. Uh, during experiment one, each participant completed each direction one at a time with all the scaled values, and all the scaled values were randomly ordered. We also counterbalance the direction orders for each participant. So for results, because of our two alternative force choice of study approach, we conducted a psychometric data analysis. We locked participants' answer to the question of the normal or not normal, and then we aggregated all the answers per each direction. And we calculated the probability of normal answers divided by normal and not normal answers. And after that, we fitted psychometric functions for slow scale hand movements that you can see in the left and faster scale hand movements, which you can see in the right. The drop down lines here represent a detection threshold based on a 50% detection probability, and the error bar shows a 95% confidence interval. Then we compare the detection thresholds to see whether we can find any significant difference between them, especially for, in regards of the direction. And um, here, the star represents a, a statistical significance. And our results show that all of the directions, both for slow and fast scales, were significantly different from each other. Also here, you can see that the detection threshold for the fast scales in the y direction is higher than all of them. And in the x direction, is the smallest. That I will talk about them more in the discussion section. So now let's move on to the experiment two. In this experiment, we had task complexity in a game context. 
again, we had two independent variables. The first independent variable were the scale values, which are the same as experiment one. And the second independent variable is two task complexity levels. We had a basic, basic game and a complex game. Again, we follow the within subjects of study design with repeated measures, and we had 20 university students as our participants. Here in this video, you can see a demo of the basic game. In the basic game, the user had to catch some targets, and then they were asked, was the hand movement normal or not normal? The user was not limited to any uh, hand movement, and they could use their hand, their hand freely. In the second version of the game, uh, we tried to increase the cognitive demands so that the users um, uh, uh, would be distracted. Uh, that, because of that, we added an arithmetic equ equation that they had to solve. And based on the answer, they had to choose the correct color and uh, catch the correct target. And then they were again asked, was the hand movement normal or not normal? Our experiment two data analysis steps is the same as experiment one. And we again aggregated all the responses of normal and not normal based on each level of complexity. Uh, we calculated the probability of normal uh, based on the divided by normal and not normal for a slow and fast scales. And here the, again, the drop down lines present the detection threshold based on 50% detection probability. We compared uh, we compared the detection threshold to see if we have any statistical significance. And here we found that for the slow scale, there is a significant difference. But in the fastest scale, we, we didn't find any statistical significant difference. Here is a summary of our results. We present the range of scales that can be applied to the motion of virtual hand, while the difference between the physical hand movement and the virtual one is unnoticeable to users. We estimate the thresholds for each of the detection, uh, each of the directions separately, as well as the compound hand movements, which we had in the complex game scenario. These values are estimations of detecting thresholds that can be applied to either increase or decrease the speed of the virtual hand. So what are the implications of these results? Um, so we found that hand direction matters. Our results provide new insights on human perception of the scale hand movements in different motion directions in VR. We detected significant difference between the detection thresholds in different directions, both for slow and fast scales. As you can see, the range is narrower for detection of modified uh, motion scaling in the X or horizontal plane. And this may be due to the visual field of view of horizontal plane, which covers a large range than vertical. Also, our interview responses show that people said they may be more familiar with hand motion in the horizontal plane, and therefore they can detect abnormality better. Many common object motions make use of horizontal and depth motions, for example, moving objects on a table or desk, opening doors, reaching for objects, and therefore these detection thresholds can be used for those kind of applications. On the other hand, our results show that we, can, uh, we have the highest range of detection thresholds in the vertical plane. This is probably due to more limited degrees of field of, re, uh, field of view in vertical plane. And additionally, our participants during the interview section said that a less use of vertical motion in day-to-day -day interactions may be related to a larger range in detection thresholds for a scale vertical hand movements. Overall, the contributed knowledge of detection thresholds for different direction is relevant when considering application of a scaled remap hand movement in VR application. For example, in applications uh, that require use of vertical motions, for example, when we want to lift objects or making climbing gestures, hand movements can be a scale higher using this estimation of detection threshold. And therefore, we can provide higher reach for users while preserving the realism. Similarly, estimation of detection thresholds for depth interactions can be useful in applications with back and forth hand movements, such as reaching for virtual objects. Also, these scale ranges are valuable for the design of future VR applications that use scale hand movements as a modified interaction techniques while aiming to provide a realistic, natural, or immersive experience for users in VR. Slow scaled hand movements can be beneficial in situations where we want to have accuracy of an interaction. For example, when we, uh, for example, in the 
uh, VR for hand, habit, hand, hand rehabilitation training or medical training. Um, so we can provide more controlled hand movements. And by applying these scales within the proposed detection threshold, it can be expected that the discrepancies between VR and the real world would not distract the users. On the other hand, faster scale hand movements can be useful in VR applications, which aim to provide a higher range of hand reach or faster hand interactions for the VR game application. Um, using faster scale hand movements, VR users can move their uh, physical hands less while their virtual hands are moving faster and can be used to reach far distant objects. For future work, we found no significant results between the basic and complex versions of our tested game scenarios, which can be attributed to our limitation in our study design, but it may be that detection ability is not greatly affected by cognitive load differences. So more exploration in this direction can be done. Also detection thresholds for different hand, hand remapping techniques can be tested for different directions and different task complexities. Thank you very much for attending this session. Um, please uh, feel free to check out our paper. And I'm also going to be here to answer any of your questions. And also I'm going to be in the Slack. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shai. Um, very good presentation. Um, we have several questions here. I'm going to pick um, two of them um, for our uh, Q&A. Uh, one is, how long did it take for, participant, uh, uh, for a participant to finish experiment one? And do you think physical fatigue may have affected the results? Um, so for experiment one, uh, we had like one hour. And also for experiment two, we had one hour. And yes, we think that one of the limitations overall in VR um, experiments is that it might cause fatigue. But in order to increase the fatigue and also the motion sickness during our experiments, we provided breaks for all of our users. And also uh, we, we provided mandatory breaks between each of the directions. And also every five minutes we asked them that do you want to have a break? But we can always, this is also another uh, future work that can see whether um, more exposure to virtual reality can um, change the detection thresholds or not. But we acknowledge this limitation. Okay. Um, so, so we have um, one other question here. And actually, some questions touching the same point. Um, so, one question is related to if uh, were all the if you tested the participants for for their being left left-handed or right-handed, um, and if you think that that would uh, uh, turn out some changes in the results. Um, so uh, we didn't like um, directly uh, look at like the right hand or left hand, and by chance, all of our participants for both experiments were right-handed. So. Uh, I think it's an interesting question to look for future research to see whether the uh, left or being left-handed or right-handed is different or not. But in our experiment, we were expecting to have like both left-handed and right-handed and the people who were right-handed used the right um, controller and left were using the left controller. But as I said, we didn't have any left-handed participants, so I'm not sure. It's like a future research. Okay, um, so we I think we have time for 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 one more. Um, question here: Can you explain the result where you found difference between high and low uh, condition uh, for the slow version but not fast version? Um, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, can you explain the result where you found differences between high and low uh, uh, conditions? Uh, in the for, for this low version, but not for the fast. So high and low, I think it, it's the Y axis, and then you found results for the slow, but not for the fast movement. Oh, I think it's like for the, I mean, based on my understanding, this is like for the complex activities, we found significant difference in the 
slower ones, but we didn't find any significant difference in the faster one. So if this question is regarding that, um, we think that this might be due to our limitation of our study. Maybe our two conditions was not cognitive, was not different enough to show that difference. That's why we didn't report on that. Um, that's because we didn't find a significant difference for both fast and slow. Okay. Um, do we have time for one more? Okay. 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 So um, there's one question here regard, regarding the application in rehabilitation. Don't you consider relearning wrong motions due to the introduced scales as a troublesome or, uh, um, yeah, do you think there's a problem with that? Um, so the thing is, uh, based on our results, we see that users do, do not notice the difference. So they still think it's normal. It's, it doesn't uh, change their uh, perception of their virtual hand saying that, oh, this is really slow. It's just like a kind of uh, a change that we do in the virtual world, but the user do not notice. So this was like the whole research goal is that we find the detection threshold so that before that, the user do not understand that difference. So I think like if we want to make the hand movement a little bit slower, it's a still to the point that the user do not under do, do not notice that difference. If that answers the question. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So um, I guess we go uh, to the next paper. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you, Shai. The next paper is uh, the impact of multisensory stimuli on confidence levels uh, for perceptual cognitive tasks in VR by uh, Sangshu. Hi, uh, can I start? All right, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Song Choi Jung. I'm working at the Heath Lab in New Zealand as a postdoc. I'm happy to give a presentation about my research. The title is The Impact of Multisensor Stimuli on Competence Levels for Perceptual Cognitive Task in VR. I'm going to give a talk with this order. In our daily life, uh, we are confronting many situations which requires perceptual cognitive load. For example, sports, cook, location searching. In such a case, the right decision should be made after we account for all of the information. Though this statement is more close to the cognitive related work, still perceptual information is needed. And we are de depending on our visual, audio, tactile, smell, and even taste feedback in our life, which depends on the task type of curves. Similarly, such a perceptual cognitive load required tasks exist in the virtual environment. For example, pilot training, medical training, and even virtual cook training. However, do they really confidence what they decide in VR? Since most of VR setup only provides the vision, audio, or at best a small tactile feedback, the sensor feedback is missing compared to real world experience. To address our conjecture, we set a research question that is, does multisensory feedback enhance subjective confidence in the decision-making related task in VR? To address the research question, we choose a location searching task since it requires vision, audio, tactile, and even smell depend on the location. For example, if you have an appointment to meet in front of a lemon tree near a house, as you see the nut, the tree house and uh, even smell can have to have strong confidence on the decision. We used a two by one within subject design with one independent variables, the VR system with six dependent variables that are confidence level, consume the time for the giving answer and the correct answer ratio, sense of presence, cyber sickness, and the user preference. In multi-sensor VR, we provide the vision, audio, wind, vibration, and the smell feedback while we provide the only vision and audio in typical sensor uh, VR virtual reality system. 
To address the research question, we said three hypotheses that the first one is MVR will re result in higher confidence levels and faster response times than TVR. Second, MVR and TVR will result in similar correct answer ratio. Third, MVR will result in more positive subject feelings in terms of a higher sense of presence and the light, less side sickness than TVR. We asked the participants to experience several virtual environments that were rendered with two types of a virtual reality feedback system for the same environment. The island scene contained four train, two orange tree, four helicopters, and a waterfall scattered over the island. First, a participant was located in a darkened space, and we provided a description about the location. And after confirming the description by the participant, the participant teleported to a certain place over the island. Then, they were asked to choose whether it is correct place or not compared to the description through so yes or no interface using a Vive controller. Then they were asked to report their confidence levels using a vertical gaze bar using the same Vive controllers again. We adopted, we adopted a signal detection theory with a two alternative first choice, the participants should choose if the place is a description matched place or not under two conditions, the sensor matched or mismatched in either MVR or TVR. We differentiate the sensory component combination and code it as we see in this slide. For example, for the visual components, we prepared a helicopter, train, orange tree, and a waterfall with grasses. Here is the used combination of the sensory component in the study. For example, script number two, you are in a scene where there is a train moving. Then we provide the train and train audio, tar smell, wind blowing, and the rumbling vibration in the matched con condition in MVR while we missed some feedbacks in the mismatched condition in embryo. Similarly, we variated the feedbacks, but we only handed the vision and the audio feedback in TVR. Here is our system. We implemented a client and server model as a basic structure. The system features flow vibration feedback, wind feedback, and the scent feedback matching the visual and the audio feedback. The client model renders the real environment and the data logging, and the server controls the additional sensory feedback for wind, smell, and the flow vibration. For flow vibration, we attach the four speakers underneath the floor and send the audio signal. For wind, we use the brushless DC fan, which we can control the speed from zero to 255. For smell, we attached a USB aroma diffuser to a dedicated fan. After sending a signal, the USB diffuser starts to heating and we could deliver the scent to the user who sits in the center of the case. Empirically deciding on effective strength of a formulated odor is not intuitive compared to other sensory modality due to the complex human nasal system, air conditioning, and the individual health condition. To minimize odor de detecting error, we conducted a pilot study with 10 male and six female participants to decide the odorant intensity level. In this pilot study, we used the same uh, study design. We confirm the required number of participants using power analysis, and we needed to have a minimum of 15 participants. We recruited a new group of the participants, and there are a total of uh, 17 participants included in this study. Here is the procedure of the study. After we gave uh, informed consent, after we having the, uh, the agreement, we asked to fill out the demographics and we gave an instruction of the study and it kept the devices to the each of participant. After participant had a test trial of the system,
Then we conduct a study with the first condition. After that, we asked the participants to fill out the questionnaire and we gave a break time. After that, we resume the uh, study with a second condition and also ask the questionnaire to fill out. After that, we had an interview and we ended the study. Uh, here, I would like to show a video for the whole procedure of the study. So we conducted this study with, uh, within subject study. And uh, af uh, at the first, participant locates in a darkened space and we provide the instruction of the study. And uh, here is a sentence, the description about the location. After then, each participant, let me, okay, cut down the sound, okay. Participants should give uh, the answer and then uh, also providing their confidence level regarding their decision. Here is the second example. And the participant located in a, a near waterfall and they have to give uh, the answer, yes or no, and uh, providing their confidence level using the gaze bar. And this is so the example. And then we locate the participant near the orange tree and then the train is passing by and providing their confidence level. And then we differentiate eight uh, places over the island. And then here is the, how we visualize the, the flow vibration patterns. So this is for helicopters. And this is for train vibration. And the third one is um, for the waterfall. All right. Uh, so here's the result of the confidence level. There is a weak negative correlation between time lapse and the confidence level. Increases in time lapse were correlated with a decrease in a rating of confidence level. And the TVR shows a higher confidence level than MVR. Due to the low complexity of the task, we found a sailing effect from the result. We found that the time consumption fails to reject the null hypothesis between the two virtual reality system types, but loosely supports the difference still and limit a higher time spending for the MVR than TVR. We used the met when you test for all items at the 5% significance level, since the anderson darling test rejects the hypothesis of normality at the 1% significance level in our data. The subjective questionnaire rejects that the sense of presence differs significantly between the two virtual reality system types and limit a higher presence for the MVR than TVR. We did not find a noticeable difference, uh, difference in first choice ratio from both system. Also, in terms of the cyber sickness, we did not find a noticeable differences between the VR systems and the both systems provoked a slight cyber sickness. All of the participants stated that they preferred to have MVR since it made them feel as if they were in the virtual environment more immersively compared to the TVR. Here is the summary regarding our finding. We found the benefit of the multi-sensor VR system over the typical sensor VR system in terms of the sense of presence and the user preference. However, MVR and the TVR shows a similar level of cyber sickness. Thus, we conclude that our finding partially support a hypothesis three, in contrast to our hypothesis, the participant shows higher confidence in the answer in the TVR system. Also, we found the time duration was slightly higher in MVR. Thus, we cannot support our hypothesis uh, one. As regarding the confidence level, we conjecture the higher cognitive load, which comes from multiple sensory feedback worked negatively in MVR condition. As regarding the correct answer ratio, we found that complexity of this task was easy 
and the thus correct answer ratio uh, was high and similar in both MVR and TVR. Also, we found a, a ceiling effect as well. This is our take home message. From the research, we suggest that high fidelity multi sensory rendering of the virtual environment might not be appropriate for specific application or task which require a low level of perception and cognition. However, high fidelity multi sensory will be required in the training area which requires a high level of immersion. In this study, we had a technical limitation. The aroma dispenser has a delay for eva evaporate smell and some participants had a difficulty to identify it. Similarly, some participants had a problem to distinguish the vibration type. Lastly, some participants were so unfamiliar to use a vibe controller. To wrap up, we investigate the impact of a multi-sensor feedback in VR in terms of a confidence level, mainly uh, compared to a typical sensor VR system. We provide uh, vision, audio, flow vibration, wind blowing, and smell feedback. In the study, we found significantly higher sense of presence and user preference with a multi-sensor VR system, but the confidence level was lower. Here's our contribution of this work. We showed a state-of-the-art technique to deliver diverse level of sensor feedback at once. And this is the first approach to study the confidence level with multiple sensor feedback in VR. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to hear your question. All right. Um, thank you, Sangshu. Um, we still have time for some questions. I have a couple of questions for you. Great presentation, very exciting. Um, so to to begin, first question that I would have that I have is, how did you configure um, the, for example, the strength and and how you produced the wind? according to the conditions. So you mentioned the helicopter, waterfall, train. So so how did you go about configuring those? Yeah, so actually we uh, decided the, the power, uh, the strength of the wind feedback as well uh, empirically. For example, uh, for the helicopter, uh, because of the helicopter, we could imagine we have to get the very strong wind flowing. So in this case, as, as I mentioned, we could control the wind speed from the zero to 255. So in this case, we maximized the, the wind blowing, which means 255. Otherwise, when we have a uh, uh, looking for some kind of breeze, in this case, like a, uh, just a train train passing by around me or waterfall case, then we just uh, uh, empirically uh, providing the medium size of a wind flowing, like uh, 155 things. Okay. Um, so, so my uh, second part of that question is that: um, Do you believe that precision, um, so more realistic uh, wind, or or, or uh, some of the other uh, uh, sensors uh, sensors you you work with, do you believe that having them being more realistic? Uh, would impact the confidence uh, um, in the, the MVR situation. Yeah, so that is a very interesting finding from our uh, study. So we would expect it providing more realistic sensory feedback will also increase the, the confidence level in terms of this type of a task. But we found that uh, TVR system provides the more confidence level compared to the MVR. Uh, the reason is uh, our conjecture is uh, because of the their uh, cognitive load was low, and then uh, in MVR system, each of participant has to uh, handle many sensory feedback at once, which may increase their uh, their cognitive load, which means uh, they uh, uh, their decision uh, was uh, uh, their confidence level was lower because uh, they have to think about uh, many things, think about handling many, many other feedbacks at once. Uh, so um, 
in the future work, we have to confirm this finding. Uh, to confirm this finding, we have to provide more risk, realistic multi-sensor feedback and they have to uh, deliver each of the feedback more sophisticatedly. Okay, um, we have one more question. We have another yep. question here that says, you noted some participants had trouble identifying the floor vibrations. Do you think this is because they have no idea of what that vibration normally feels like, given that many people haven't been close to a helicopter? Uh, interesting question. And then, yep. <laughs> so actually, we empirically decide the, what type of uh, vibration uh, have to give. So there is a, some kind of, a, uh, for example, if we think about a train, then we might have a kind of a rhythmical vibration like a ch -ch 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 or helicopter to something like that so yeah somehow i would agree with that uh, question so in the future work uh, maybe we have to have uh, some more solid criteria what what kind of a vibration type will be uh, provided to the each of participant and then we have to make sure if each of our participant uh, can identify, differentiate each of our vibrations as well. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the questions also, um, everybody. Um, and thank uh, you for, for your great presentation. Um, thank you. Our, our third paper um, is data-driven spatio-temporal analysis via multimodal zeitgeibers and cognitive load in VR uh, by Haodong um, Liao. And please, uh, Hello, everyone. one reminder here, please send us questions when you can. I'm Liao Haodong. Today, it's my honor to share our work of data-driven special temporal analysis via multimodal zeitgeibers and cognitive load in VR. Time controlling seems to be an illusion in the real world, but virtual reality has the potential to make it possible. One of our aims of our work is try to explore the possibility of manipulate time perception in VR. Actually, there are some researchers have done some work. For example, in 2017, they found that it is possible to use slow motion in VR to affect people's perception of time. Human density in different locations influences time estimation. And video game experience, presence, interactivity, and immersion fluency were significant predictors of time estimation accuracy. There is a publication in 2016 whose title is Who Turned the Clock? Effects of Manipulated Zygbers, Cognitive Load, and Immersion on Time Estimation. In this paper, the authors made the participant to sit in this immersive virtual environment and use the movement of the sound as their Zygbers and utilize a verbal and special related task as their cognitive task. They found that it is possible to use this way to affect people's time perception. Inspired by this work, we try to explore the effects of the manipulated zeitgeist and cognitive load on time estimation and presence. We also try to maintain the presence while manipulating the time estimation. We build the corresponding multimodal linear regression equations for predicting the sense of the time estimation deviation and the sense of presence. To better understand our work, please let me introduce some of the concepts. The first is Zeitgeist. It is put forward by Eugen Ashoff in 1965. It describes the external environmental cues which can affect our biological time. Light is the most important Zeitgeist in the natural world. That is one of the reasons why we choose the illumination intensity as our visual Zeitgeist. Cognitive load. 
it is the brain resources we required in the information processing procedure. And it can be divided into two parts, that is the attentional resources and the working memory resources. We can simply understand the concept by the example that when the cognitive load is high, for example, when we're playing video games or watching movies, we'll feel that time is passing. But when the cognitive load is low, for example, when we're waiting somebody, we'll feel that time is dragging. Actually, these two concepts are two of the main independent factors of our work. Please look at the system diagram. When we try to build a VR application, we need to take both the internal and external factors into account. When it refers to time perception, it has two parts, that is, the biological time and the psychological time. The biological time is affected by the circadian rhythm. Indulgence, nightmare, and external zygotes works together to affect the circadian rhythm. In our work, we divide the external zygotes into two parts according to human perception, that is, the visual zygotes and the auditory zygotes. What's more, we choose the illumination intensity and the ticking of a clock as our visual and auditory zygotes separately. That is how one of the independent factors, Zygbers, works. As for the psychological time, it is affected by the cognitive load. That's why we choose the due task method to measure the cognitive load. The principle of the due task method is that the performance of the primary and the secondary task shows a sub-narrow effect. That is, when the performance of the primary task increases, it will lower the performance of the secondary task. After introduce two of the main independent variables, please let me introduce the dependent variables. The first is time estimation. It describes the subject feeling of an event duration. And the rest is presence. Presence is an usually mixed up terminology with the term immersion. Actually, immersion addresses more on the system objective attributes. For example, when we have better resolution or a greater refreshing rate, we may have a better experience of immersion. But the presence addresses more on the subject feeling of being in one place or the things happen in front of you is real. That is what we call the PI and PSI. As we said before, we try to find out their relationships in our work. So we made those hypotheses which can be simplified as this. The first four are related to time estimation, and the rest of the two are related to presence. We have assess that the visual and auditory zygotes, cognitive load, immersive condition are influential to time estimation. The zygotes have no effect on the sense of presence, and higher cognitive load will lead to greater presence. To test our hypothesis, we recruit 46 participants and divide them into two groups that is, the visual groups and the auditory groups. We found a significant individual differences on time estimation, so we decided to use a mixed subject design, that is, between four visual and auditory groups within four various levels of each group. In both groups, we use a GV to represent different levels of visual zygotes, that is, different levels of illumination intensity. When the GV equals to 0, 1, and 2, they correspond to the dim light, the normal light, and the bright light condition. And we don't place sound in the video groups to avoid the interaction effect of GV and GA. Each participant will conduct five groups of experiments 
And the first two will be conducted in the non-VR condition, that is, the PC screen condition. And the rest of three will be conducted in the VR condition. As for the auditory groups, we use the GA to denote the different levels of auditory zygbers, that is, different speed of clock ticking. And when the GA equals to 0, 1, and 2, they correspond to the slow ticking, normal ticking, and quick ticking condition. One ticking in the slow ticking condition is equivalent to 2 seconds. One ticking in the normal ticking condition is equivalent to 1 second. One ticking in the quick ticking condition is equivalent to 1 third second. And there are two situations of cognitive load that is, without the cognitive load task or with the visual searching task. The participant need to press different buttons according to their observations. And we can see from the table that almost all of the results are partially or completely satisfied our hypothesis. And we also build the multimodal linear regression equations for predicting the time estimation deviation and the sense of presence successfully. After that, we use the same set of experiment design, but replace the cognitive load with a more complex, attentional-based practical game. As shown in this table, almost all of the results are the same as the original experiments. And we also use a pad sample t-test to compare the differences between the predicted and the reported values. Our results shows that our equation provides guidelines for predicting the sense of presence. Here are our limitations and conclusions. Our limitations are that the number of participants could be more, and the projecting light of HTC Vive Pro devices may also affect the results. The conclusions are that the VR does have more potential to affect users' time perception compared to the non-VR condition. Our methods provide guidelines for the building of IVES by taking those significant factors into account. To achieve better task performance and build slow IVES, it is worthwhile to take auditory zygbers into account. And it is necessary to design a new presence questionnaire to take both PI and PSI into consideration. As for the future work, we'll try to explore other potential zygbers. For visual zygbers, we'll try to uh, explore other attributes of the light, for example, the color temperature or the wavelength. As for the auditory zygbers, we'll uh, explore the effects of natural sounds, such as uh, wind or rain. Also, incorporating other multimodal information, such as the temperature. We'll also try to design a new questionnaire which can take both the PI and PSI into account. That's all. Thank you for your listening, and please feel free to contact me if you are interested in our work. All right, that was uh, very interesting. Um, and we have some questions uh, coming in. Um, so, a first question here is, um, do you believe that the type of test, so, so if we had a, a test that is more uh, game-like, more fun versus a more boring test, do you believe that would change in some way um, your results? Yeah, actually, we, we are having our experiments under the uh, non-intense environment. You know, uh, the stressful environment will uh, access our arousal level, which will affect our uh, per time perception. Actually, we have done some other uh, game-like um, experiment uh, with a game um, 
diffuse a bomb. Yeah, and we got a, a different result. So I think the answer is yes. Okay. Um, another question that that we have here is um, how do how diverse the forty six participants uh, uh, were beyond gender. Um, I think this relates to the keynote uh, speaker. And and would you think that differences in, for example, age would also impact your results? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, the gender, the age, well, uh, both of them will affect the time perception. Uh, and we recruit our uh, participants from all of our university and keep their uh, age in a you know a small range to uh, eliminate the uh, uh, other effects of uh, of the age age uh, factors in, uh, to the on the time perception. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we don't have any more questions coming. Um, so thank you so much. It was very very interesting. Um, we still have two more presentations to go. Um, uh, yeah, uh, ex <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a message. <laughs> yeah, I would like to mention that uh, there will be a birds of feather gathering held by me 30 minutes after this whole session. And the theme would be time manipulation in VR. And so please feel free to come and chat. Thanks. All right, yeah, we should all go there. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go right to the next one. And uh, uh, again, don't forget, I'm monitoring Slido for your questions. They are incredible. They have been great so far, uh, but keep them coming. The next one is um, think twice the influence of immersion on decision making during gambling in virtual reality. That's, um, I think we have two people presenting, Sebastian Oberdoffer and David Heidrich. Let's see. Introduction and welcome to our presentation of Think Twice, the influence of immersion on decision making during gambling and virtual reality. I am Sebastian and I'm the one embodied in this orange avatar. And I'm David and I'm here in the black avatar. Okay, so let's start. Uh, gambling addiction, despite being a disorder affecting millions of people worldwide, is pretty interesting. Like alcohol addiction or nicotine addiction, gambling addiction is classified as a substance use disorder. The substance, however, is not money, despite money playing an important role. The substance here are the audiovisual stimuli by the gambling games. In commercial gambling, the bank or the owner of the gambling machine always wins. And on average, players put in much more money than they get back as a win. So it doesn't sound like a good decision to play gambling games. However, gambling games are pretty good at impairing the decision-making of the players. In fact, there's a correlation between decision-making and problem gambling severity. So, uh, yeah, uh, an, ac an active impairment, for example, is uh, our fake wins. So the player puts in 100 coins, gets back 80 coins, and despite having lost 20 coins, the machine is displaying that he has won 80 coins. And this creates similar positive emotions like a real win would have done. And passive impairments are mostly gambler's fallacies. So when people know that there's a chance of one out of 10 to win something, and they have lost nine times in a row, then people tend to believe that the next time has a much higher chance of winning. So one of the most played VR-based or virtual reality free-to-play games on Steam right now is a gambling game. So with the rising popularity of VR-based gambling games, 
it's pretty important to investigate the risk potential of those VR-based gambling games. And that's something that we started last year at IEEE VR, where we showed that, harm, that the harm-inducing factors, dissociation, urge to gamble, and dark flow were stronger in a VR-based environment. So this time, we are going to look at decision-making. And based on the somatic marker hypothesis, which is commonly associated with decision-making, emotions can impair decision-making and cause unfavorable decisions. When we put this into virtual reality, uh, I guess everyone is going, everyone who has played a VR-based horror game before is going to agree that VR can significantly increase emotions. So we believe that a higher immersion in a VR-based representation is going to impair decision-making. To test our hypothesis, uh, we use the Iowa gambling task. In the Iowa gambling task, a participant has to draw 100 cards from four different card decks. And every time they draw a card, they win money and sometimes they also lose money. However, the participant does not know how many cards he has to draw. And the card decks, they follow a static win and loss schedule. And the first two card decks, card deck A and B, uh, every time they draw a card from this, they win $100. And every time they draw a card deck from C and D, they win $50. So card deck, B and C, and by the way, the goal is obviously to win as much money as possible, or to have as much money as possible at the end. So deck A and B seem to be more beneficial or more advantageous than deck C and D. However, like in deck A, the third card that they draw additionally creates a loss. So they draw a card, they win $100, and additionally they lose $150. And the losses in deck A and B are that big that on the long term, deck A and B are disadvantages, while deck C and D are disadvantages on the long term. And people tend to figure it out while they are drawing those 100 cards. And in the end, they tend to draw more cards from deck C and D. And that's also the way, uh, or that's also how you evaluate the Iowa gambling task. You basically look at the cards that they have drawn from each deck, and people who have drawn more cards from deck C and D uh, have a better decision-making than people who have drawn more cards from deck A and B. So this is how our implementation of the Iowa gambling task uh, looks like. So we put everything into a 3D environment and we basically have all the uh, elements of the original Iowa gambling task. And if the cameraman is, is following me to this video, uh, you can see the gameplay. So we basically have a desktop and a VR-based representation. This is the desktop-based representation. And participants can select cards using the touchpad of an HTC Vive controller in both conditions. And every time they draw a card, they win money, and sometimes they also lose some money. And this is the VR representation. It's completely the same, same input, same UI elements. We also made sure that the size of the UI elements are exactly the same in both conditions. And like in the original Iowa gambling task, everything, every time the current money or the current cash pile of the participant is changing, you can also see the green bar changing. Okay, returning back to the, to the slides. Our Iowa gambling task has four different states. So the first state uh, on the top here, you can see that the participant has won something. There you can see that the participant has lost something. Uh, on this side, you can see that a card deck is empty. So every card deck has 40 cards. And when the participant has drawn all 40 cards of one card deck, they can't draw anything more. And the last uh, thing here is when the participant has drawn all 100 cards, and then uh, they get the notification that the study is done. All right. To um, validate our hypothesis whether immersion has an effect on simulated real world decision making or not, we came up with a pretty simple in between groups study design. So we had our two versions of the Iowa gambling task. We had the version for uh, virtual reality as well as we had the version for desktop. And those two versions of the game were our two conditions. 
We compared both conditions with respect to presence as well as decision making. And yeah, for uh, presence, we used a mid immersion questionnaire. For decision making, we obviously used the Alva Gambling task. In total, we recruited 50 participants, of which 25 were assigned to the VR condition and 25 were assigned to the desktop condition. The average age was 20.44 years for the VR condition and 21.8 years for the desktop condition. Our study setup was also quite simple. We provided a separate questionnaire station. Here, the participants filled in the demographical questionnaire. We also provided a desktop as well as a VR station. Here, the participants played the respective version of the Iowa gambling task. During the experiment, the experimenter sat at a separate desk and was pretending to work to not distract the participants from playing the game. After the experiment, we also provided additional information material concerning the risks of gambling to the participants. Looking at our results, we found a significant difference between the two conditions with respect to presence. Here, the VR condition reported a significantly higher presence rating than the desktop condition. This validated our implementation of the Iowa Gambling Task for Virtual Reality as a higher immersion leads to higher perceived presence. Looking at the results with respect to decision making, we also found a significant difference between the two conditions. Here, the virtual reality condition drew significantly more bad cards than the desktop condition. Looking at this result in more detail, we found further uh, significant differences. We found a significant difference for deck A, which is uh, a bad deck, and we found a significant difference for deck D, which is a good deck. For deck A, the participants um, of the VR condition drew significantly more bad cards. For deck D, the participants of the desktop condition drew significantly more good cards. We also analyzed whether the participants developed a certain understanding for the underlying principles of the Iowa gambling task and for the game rounds between game round 41 to 60 and for the game rounds 81 to 100, we found significant differences between the two conditions. Here, the desktop condition always drew less bad cards or significantly less cards than the um, VR condition. Looking at this result in more detail, we can clearly see that the decision-making patterns in the uh, desktop condition changed over time. So we can see around game round 41 to 60 that the participants might have developed some kind of hunch for the underlying principles of the Iowa gambling task. And this finally led to a uh, decline in the number of bad cuts drawn. This um, change in the patterns and the development of a hunch was not present in the VR condition, however. So what does it mean? On the one hand, our results um, support our hypothesis that immersion impairs simulated real-life decision-making. In addition, we found no development of an understanding for the underlying principles of the Iowa gambling task in the VR condition. This, on the one hand, could be a result of immersion in the virtual environment blocking out all external stimuli. So the participants of the desktop condition merely had to turn their head, and by turning their head, they were no longer immersed in the gameplay of the Iowa game, uh, game gambling task, and this might have resulted in some additional analytical thoughts and thus in a better development of an understanding for the underlying principles of this task. The virtual reality condition, however, was constantly present in the virtual environment and thus had not the chance to um, have these analytical thoughts. In addition, in accordance with the somatic marker hypothesis, presence increases emotions. And since we had a significantly higher presence in the VR condition, um, this higher presence might have also affected the decision making by just increasing the emotions experienced during the gameplay. This also leads over to our future work because we want to find out whether presence indeed has an effect on decision making or not. And so we want to provide a low and a high presence version of the Iowa gambling task to analyze the effects of presence. And in addition to that, we also want to provide an embodiment. On the one hand, embodiment is already used in current gambling games. So like Poker Stars VR or so, they already provide some rudimentary uh, embodiment and embodiment might already have an effect on decision making. So it's important to investigate if it indeed has an effect. And on the other hand, embodiment, especially when using photorealistic avatars, 
is increasing presence. So we can also use the embodiment to moderate and to adjust the uh, level of presence experienced during the gameplay. Finally, we want to remodel the lab environment in virtual reality and uh, thus creating the same situation in virtual reality as for the desktop condition. So when playing the Iowa Gambling Cast in VR on a simulated computer screen, then the participants can also turn their head and can uh, be distracted from the um, gameplay of the other gambling task. And this could lead to those additional analytical thoughts that might um, have an effect on the decision-making um, patterns uh, during the gameplay. In uh, this case, we expect that we will find no longer a significant difference between the two versions of the other gambling task. All right, what's the takeaway from our presentation? On the one hand, we are the first who have provided and developed a virtual reality version of the Alva Gambling Task. If you read our paper carefully, you can find a download link to our version of the Alva Gambling Task for your very own research. On the other hand, we have also found first evidence that immersion impairs simulated real-world decision-making in virtual reality. With that, I hope you found this presentation interesting. I hope I raised your um, attention for uh, reading our paper. And yeah, we are ready to take further questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right, this this was really interesting. Um, um, Thank you. Very exciting topic and, and very exciting presentation. Uh, uh, really, really interesting. I think uh, um, everybody that watched it found it uh, to be really fun. We have a lot of questions here. Um, so, so first one, um, do you think that previous experience of participants might play a role in the results? Could the novelty effect of VR to participants participants uh, with little experience impact their decision-making process? Um, it depends if previous uh, experience is as just uh, with respect to virtual reality or with the gambling task. Of course, if you have played the gambling task before, then you would no longer be a good participant for it because once you have played it once, you understood the underlying principles. So we made sure that the participants were not aware of the Iowa gambling task before and that they uh, were completely new to it. And um, indeed, the um, first experience to virtual reality might have had an effect on it. But in our virtual reality condition, we had um, participants with previous experience with, with respect to virtual reality, as well as um, completely new and novice participants with respect to virtual reality. And we found no significant difference between the two um, subgroups inside the virtual reality condition. So the, um, there was no effect on novelty on the results. Okay, interesting. Um, um, another one, this is an interesting question. Uh, um, that's also an interesting question. Do you think results could have changed if participants were using real money? If so, in which way? Oh, that, that's a completely different and a very complex topic because um, there were so many studies with respect to gambling that either used virtual money or real money. And in the one case, um, the real money uh, is, of course, providing a better incentive because, hey, it's real money. But on the other hand, um, when you have virtual money, you tend to play more risky because you start to lose the connection to your real money and it's just a virtual coin, you don't really see that it's maybe worth $5 or so. So in both ways, it could have an effect on it, but in either way, it might lead to a different outcome. So it's really hard to say. And even the uh, literature so far is not really providing a good evidence or a good direction in which you should go. And so we decided to go for the uh, virtual currency because in um, current virtual reality gambling games, that's often the used currencies. You're not playing with, with real money, you're just playing with virtual coins. And so we thought, okay, we go for a virtual currency to uh, make it more appropriate and more fitting for our context of research. Okay, so one more um, 
wouldn't VR be a lower presence environment than an actual gambling, gambling table, which could point to lower presence causing us to make worse decisions? Oh, that's also a tough one. Um, in uh, the end, uh, of course, it depends how good the simulation of uh, the um, real gambling table is in uh, virtual reality. I mean, if you do have a very low poly realization of the game and very low presence, it might already have an effect and might be not as realistic. But on the other hand, uh, it was already shown um, with uh, problem gamblers who indeed have um, some kind of um, addiction to gambling that even a virtual slot machine can evoke the same um, urge to gamble as a real slot machine. So in this case, um, literature provided some evidence that indeed, uh, if it looks realistic enough and if it's providing the exact same game mechanics um, or what David has called it, the, um, active, um, uh, the active influence, then um, yeah, we might have still the same urge to gamble. And indeed, as David also mentioned in our previous in previous year, our results were done with a virtual slot machine and there we found the same patterns as with a real slot machine. Okay, um, thank you so much again. Uh, very nice uh, to, to hear about your topic, to see your presentation. Um, so with this, we, we go on to our fifth uh, um, and final paper of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the title of the paper is Examining Whether Secondary Effects of Temperature Associated Virtual Stimuli Influence Subjective Perception of Duration uh, with, uh, by Austin Erickson. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Austin Erickson. Uh, I'll be giving this talk today about uh, secondary effects of uh, virtual temperature associated stimuli on people's perceptions of duration. Um, so a few years back uh, we saw some interesting work uh, by Christian Sandor's group. It was uh, a paper called uh, Burn AR by Ware et al. Um, and it started off as a demonstration where they showed that um, um, they would have these users come up and hold out their hands and in the AR headset they would show these virtual fire, virtual flames that would appear over the surface of their hand uh, and would interact with their hand motion as well. Um, an unintended side effect of this demonstration was that a lot of the participants actually felt as though their hand was warming in response to this uh, virtual fire. Um, so a significant amount of their uh, participants experienced that sensation some even experienced it so strongly that they felt like they needed to discontinue the demonstration. Um, so it's very interesting that with these virtual effects, we're able to achieve these um, uh, effects that our participants are considering to be physical. Um, in similar work, there's uh, shown that um, uh, in a paper called Snow World, that uh, if you build a cold virtual environment um, with enough content to it, you can um, use that to treat burn victims and actually show um, decreased um, uh, pain when they're in this cold environment than they are without it. So um, both of these kind of introduce this idea that virtual effects can have these kind of semi-physical effects on our participants. Uh, my group did one study in this as well, and we investigated both warming and cooling sensations uh, and were able to achieve both with significant results uh, with uh, virtual fire and virtual kind of icy fog. Um, additionally, we looked at the location of the stimulus and found that it doesn't even need to be just over your hand, that you can place it in the environment around the user and still achieve similar results. Um, so in the psychology literature, there is um, a large body of research that looks into a relationship between body temperature and sense of duration. Um, so basically, if you have a participant who's sitting in an ice bath and you ask them to count to 30 seconds or estimate when 30 seconds have gone by, they will tend to overestimate that time interval. They maybe will count to 35 or to 40 seconds while thinking that that time interval was actually 30 seconds. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, the similar thing happens when their body temperature is increased physically. Um, there is, uh, psychologists believe that there's a quickening of the biological processes that make these uh, participants underestimate 
the time intervals. So they'll maybe only count to 20 or 25 seconds uh, instead of reaching the full 30. They'll think that that 25 second interval has been a full 30 seconds. Um, so both of these effects are a direct consequence of body temperature and we've shown in this previous literature, uh, in the previous AR work, that we're able to achieve significant effects on people's perceptions of their body temperature. Um, so we're interested in seeing if we can achieve these time effects as well. Um, before we get into the details here, uh, just a quick review of the difference between a primary and a secondary effect. Um, of course, a primary effect is uh, a direct consequence of a stimulus or an action. So I'm near a fire and now I feel hot, or my hand is on fire virtually and now it feels warm. Uh, whereas our secondary, secondary effects or second order effects are a direct consequence of another consequence. So X causes Y and then Y causes Z. Um, so for instance, we're in our uh, cold water, we're in our ice bath, now we feel cold, and as a result of our body temperature decrease, we're now overestimating our time intervals. Um, so we're interested in the secondary or second order effects uh, for our work here. Um, what's interesting is that uh, a lot of AR research right now is only interested in primary effects. Um, second order or secondary effects are uh, investigated somewhat in the um, uh, more social behavior um, studies, but uh, less so in general. Um, so we were interested in looking into what types of secondary effects can be achieved with virtual stimulus and uh, what the limitations of virtual stimulus are uh, compared to a physical stimulus. Um, so this led us to two research questions. The first is we have these uh, virtual temperature associated stimuli, such as fire or, or virtual ice. Can we achieve these second order effects on perception of time? Uh, our second is that if we can achieve these effects, how does the location of the stimulus impact the effect? So we designed a study around these questions. Uh, it ended up being a two by three full factorial within subjects design uh, with 18 participants. Um, so we had uh, two variables, one of which is the apparent temperature of the uh, um, virtual stimulus. So it could be either hot uh, by uh, being displayed with flames or it could be cold by being displayed with snow or icy fog. Um, we had an additional variable which was the location of this virtual stimulus as well. So that location could be in direct contact with the user where it's showed over their outstretched hand. Uh, it could be in indirect contact with the user and shown in the room around them but not directly touching them. Or it could be in uh, simultaneous contact where it's both on their hand and in the room around them at the same time. Um, we had two measures for our uh, study here. The first is on the primary effect, which was their temperature perception. So to do this, we use the ASHRAE scale. Uh, it's a common scale used for judging uh, um, environment temperatures. Um, and we ask our participants to rate both their body temperature and their environment temperature after each condition um, using the scale. For our secondary effects, which are the uh, perception of time effects, we use um, prospective estimation um, and have our participants estimate three time intervals per condition. So they will hear a tone on the headset. Upon hearing that tone, they will uh, say stop after they believe that 30 seconds have, has elapsed. Um, they're allowed to use any strategy they want besides using a clock or a timer. So they can count to 30 in their head or they can tap their foot, whatever they feel they need to do to judge when 30 seconds has gone by. Um, here's a quick uh, overview of our study environment. Um, participants would arrive and would sit in an isolation booth at a desk. Um, their hand would be outstretched on the desk in front of them uh, in a position to where the virtual effects could or uh, could appear over the top of it. Um, they would be wearing the Microsoft HoloLens to see these effects. Um, prior to starting with any of the conditions, we did some baseline measurements. Um, so we got three time estimates from, our, uh, from the participant and then uh, a body temperature estimate and an environment temperature estimate as well. Uh, following these baseline measurements, we would go into the main block of conditions. Uh, since there were six total, we used a Latin square to counterbalance 
the presentation of them between uh, conditions. Uh, after experiencing all of the conditions in the study, we went ahead and did uh, a quick post questionnaire with some demographics and short responses. Um, so uh, to visualize what was happening to our participants here, uh, we have our direct contact or on-body conditions. These could be either hot or cold. So for the hot conditions, we have fire, which appears over their outstretched hand. Uh, and we have a ball of icy fog, which would appear for the cold conditions. Uh, these were paired with uh, crackling fire sound effects or with uh, kind of a howling wind sound effect as well. For our indirect contact or in-room um, located effects, uh, there would not be anything over the user's hand, uh, but two things would happen in the room around them. The first is that the floor would change depending on the temperature, so it would either change to look as though it had turned into lava, um, or it would change to look like it was covered in snow. Um, and then the second is that other effects would happen on the walls and in the area inside the room. So if the users were to look up, they would see that there were clouds surrounding them with, uh, with uh, snow uh, coming down from the clouds. Um, and then in the hot conditions, they would see flames creeping around the walls uh, in the room with them. Um, for our third location, the simultaneous contact, we simply combined these two, um, these two uh, pairs of stimulus. So in addition to like having the fire in the room around them and the lava on the floor, they would also have that flame appear on their outstretched hand. Um, so here's our first page of results. Uh, we'll go ahead and start out with the primary effects, which were their perceptions of body, uh, their perceptions of temperature in general. So this slide shows their body temperature estimates after experiencing these conditions. Um, we use the ASHRAE scale, which is displayed on the left side there. So as you can see, the number four means neutral. Um, anything higher than that means warm or hot, depending on the magnitude. Anything lower than the number four means cool or cold, also depending on the magnitude. So if we follow that number four horizontal line across, we see that our conditions are actually um, you know, warmer or colder, uh, depending on that apparent temperature. This was a significant main effect. Um, so for any location that we displayed um, those stimulus, it did impact their perception of their body temperature. Um, we also did measures of their environment temperature. So we asked them how warm or cold they felt the room to be. Um, and again, we did see this significant impact of these virtual effects on their sense of environment temperature. Um, although with more variation in the hot um, conditions than we had for the body temperature. So we were able to achieve these primary effects on our users' sense of temperature for both their body and for their environment around them. Uh, now we come to our secondary effects, which are their time estimates. So I mentioned our users were targeting 30 seconds as their time. They were trying to get to 30 second interval. Um, we did baseline measurements prior to doing the conditions and the average for those baseline measurements came out to be 33.8 seconds. So in general, they overestimated their time intervals. Um, when we look at the condition estimates compared to this baseline, they are all right around that same area. Um, so we did not actually see any significant difference between their temperature estimates um, um, between hot and cold temperatures or between their temperature estimates compared to their baseline average. So this brings us back to our research question, which was, can we achieve these secondary effects on the user's perception of duration? Uh, and in our case here, uh, we did not. There was no significant differences that we were able to collect. Um, we were also, uh, we also did a power analysis which suggested the effect size was 0 0.005 or very small effect, uh, which would need 214 participants to measure. Um, so there's two reasons why this could have happened. And the, the first could be that um, there is this physical temperature change that's necessary to achieve this particular effect on their perception of time. Um, and that we're not achieving that physical temperature change, even though we are achieving a significant perceptual change. Um, the second could be that the realism of our air effects is just not quite there 
uh, to be able to induce these secondary effects. So as a general takeaway here, um, we were able to achieve these interesting primary effects on their perceptions of temperature, but not those secondary effects on their perception of time. Um, in general, secondary effects are pretty under, under investigated in AR, and we think there is a uh, potential there for future work. Um, we're interested in seeing what types of AR stimulus may be able to induce other types of secondary effects. Um, and then we're also able, uh, we're also interested in seeing if we may be able to, ad to design AR stimulus that's capable of controlled physiological changes. So we're able to affect their perceptions of temperature, but can we design a stimulus that actually raises or decreases their body temperature? That would be interesting to see. Um, thank you guys so much for your attention, um, and I will be around in the chat to answer any questions. Thank you again. All right, very nice presentation. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Austin. Um, we have questions um, still coming here. Um, I have one first question uh, for you. Um, so you showed you showed the fire in in, in some eyes in the hands of uh, um, the person, the participants, and the question is: Would you believe that a more realistic scenario in terms of where you show that perception, that that stimuli of uh, hot or cold uh, would change the results. For example, uh, um, holding a ball of fire does not seem to be very realistic, but maybe putting your hand, placing your hands close to a a uh, um, a fire would be um, an example of something that is more realistic. Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, um, the uh, kind of visual fidelity of the effects certainly may play a part there, um, and that's something that we haven't uh, uh, haven't really experimented with uh, as like an independent variable, like changing uh, um, just how realistic those effects look. Uh, but it certainly could play a part. Um, otherwise, it could be um, that uh, just that we're not able to achieve the specific secondary effect on their uh, perceptions of time. You know, it could be that we actually do need that um, that physical um, body temperature change to be able to elicit that. Um, so, uh, but maybe if we find a, a certain type of stimulus that can elicit that type of uh, body temperature change, we could we can achieve it. I think it'd be uh, definitely interesting to look into. Interesting. Um, another question. Um, so, so you're looking. I think you, you mentioned that one, one underlying question that you're looking for or, or uh, um, a motivation is to further understand um, secondary effects, right? So you're looking at uh, uh, um, temperature. Uh, are there some other secondary effects that you have planned to look into that you find interesting? Um, I don't really have any that I uh, plan to further look into at the moment. I'm kind of working uh, in another area at, uh, right now. Um, but uh, with like some of the uh, previous presentations that came up, um, you know, they mentioned that cognitive load can have impacts on your time perception. Um, so that would be another interesting one to look into uh, in, a, in a similar manner here. Um, otherwise, we could start to look into other uh, physiological changes, like maybe uh, trying to design a stimulus that can um, uh, impact your heart rate. And then maybe we can measure a secondary effect based on heart rate. So I, I think either of those would be uh, interesting to look into for further work. All right, okay. Um, so with that said, um, I'm gonna thank Austin. Great job, um, very interesting topic. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna actually take this time also to thank all the other presenters. Um, also, uh, uh, um, thank here uh, Brooke Bowers, that was our coordinator and made us all uh, be up to speed to present this today. Uh, thank you for participating. All the questions that you guys sent um, were awesome and, and make this actually uh, 
be interesting and fun. At least I had fun. I can see from the faces from the other presenters, they had fun also. So um, with that said, thank you. Um, yeah, signing off. <laughs>